Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jill Calate. I'm on the board of Spencertown Academy Art Center and co-chair of the Festival Books Committee. I want to warmly welcome you to this afternoon's presentation. Thank you for joining us. You may know that in a normal year, we would be sitting together outside under a big tent behind our beautiful building. But this year, we'll be meeting all our guest authors virtually. Today, we are delighted to have the esteemed author and illustrator Peter Cease with us. Peter is internationally famous for his work, among which are his many children's books, also read and admired by adults, such as Tibet, Through the Red Box, the Madlenka books, and The Wall, Growing Up Behind the Red Curtain. His latest book is Nikki and Vera, a quiet hero of the Holocaust and the children he rescued. We'll be talking about that today. Peter is the recipient of numerous awards, including a MacArthur Fellowship Award, that's the Genius Grant, the Caldecott Medal, and the Hans Christian Andersen Award. An amazing, uh, in addition to his amazing art and compelling stories, it seems to me that there is an underlying humanistic message in much of his work. We will discover more about Peter through his interviewer, festival committee member, Carl Atkins. Carl is a medical doctor specializing in oncology. He is also a specialist in the sonnets of Shakespeare and has written several books on the Bard, the latest of which is just out called Shakespeare's Sonnets Among His Private Friends. We'll have a Q&A following this discussion. So feel free to submit your questions at any time by the Q&A button at the information bar at the bottom of your screen. And I can't forget to tell you about the big online book sale going on until the end of this month. Lots of goodies in our special books collection. And one of Peter's books was on sale, but it's gone. It was sold <laughs> right away. For more information about that, and the other author presentations on the tap, please go to our website, spencertownacademy.org. Now, onward to our interview. Welcome, Peter and Carl. Hi, Peter. Thanks so much for joining us. So um, obviously, that's a lot of awards. You're very successful at what you do. Uh, I'm interested to find out how, how it is you came to become an author and illustrator of children's books. What led you to this very successful career of yours? So I should say I'm very happy to be with you. I was also hoping I would be walking around Spencer Town. I go, my esteemed editor of 27 years, wonderful Francis Foster, resided in Old Chatham. So I was uh, in the area a lot and lots of my books went through some first discussion in, in Old Chatham in her wonderful house uh, of hers and her husband, Tony. I should say very quickly that I never wanted to be in children's book. I studied mm -hmm. in the art schools in Prague and in London. My whole family was involved in films and movies. My father was a film director. My brother is a film director. My sister is a film editor. So I started in animation. I did a few animated films, won a big festival in Berlin in 1980 and was invited to come to the United States just for a few months to make a film in Los Angeles for the Olympic Games in 1984, which is now for lots of people before, way before they were born. I started to work on the film and uh, got also invited to work on the project for a new company called MTV to make a song of Bob Dylan, You Got to Serve Somebody. So for a little bit, I thought I'm on the top of the world, but because I came from the from behind the Iron Curtain, from the East um, European country, the Soviet Union then, which again, I have to explain to kids what was Soviet Union, decided to boycott the Olympic Games and I, all the East European countries were supposed to stop whatever they were doing and come back. So I got a cable to come back. I didn't go back and I um, ended up in Los Angeles um, looking for the asylum, but also without any work. And, and somebody sent my 
drawings to uh, Mr. Maurice Sendak, who was the most famous American sort of children's book author, but I really didn't know who he was. And he called me in Los Angeles Collect and said, so you want to do children's books? And I really didn't want to do children's books, but when you <laughs> broke and you don't speak any English and you have no hope, you say, of course, I want to do children's books. And he said, but then you cannot live in this terrible place called Hollywood. You have to come to the East Coast which I did, and he introduced me to children's books. Uh, first, my ideas seemed to be outrageous. I also needed to get money for to pay the rent. So I started to illustrate for New York Times, which took like 17 years I was illustrating for New York Times book review. I started to do editorial illustration, and the editors would give me work, but didn't quite understand what my stories are about, because I didn't grow up in America, and I was trying to fit in, but I I couldn't, so I was doing lots of illustrations for other people, and some of these books got awards, like Whipping Boy was a Newbery book. I also did some adult illustrations, for, I mean, for adult books, or for for book for fiction and nonfiction. And then finally, with Francis, who was in Old Chatham, I got my first shot in 1987. I did book Rainbow Rhino, and slowly, I was lucky because it was a time of picture books getting bigger and more colorful, and my Art was more appreciated. So for um, 10 years, 12 years, I, I was doing bigger and bigger books. And uh, as you said, I'm, I'm good in uh, getting awards. There are some other authors who are like best-selling authors. I'm always like the award-winning author, which doesn't mean the books sell as the best-selling authors, but I was blessed because I could do what I wanted. I could really be an artist. And sometimes the idea didn't quite fit into any other genre. So it's called children's books or picture books. But sometimes people come and say, my child, it's too, it's too sophisticated. But then again, you have lots of little children who are very smart. So I've been doing books now for uh, all the time. And, and I take it as my little films because the books are like, I'm editing the pages and I'm telling the stories I find interesting. And so far, I was lucky to find the publishers who still want to uh, print them despite the iPhones and, and iPads and everything. So that's my life in America in short. So, so you, you brought up the, the idea of, of the topics that you picked. There, there's, some of them are very interesting. I'm, I'm interested in the, in the, auto, in the uh, biography that you wrote about Antoine de Saint-Exupéry, the, the uh, prince the uh, pilot and the little prince. That's certainly an unusual topic. Why did you write that book? So if I look at all these books I did about some people like Galileo or Charles Darwin or mm -hmm. Antoine de Saint-Exupéry, these are sort of people who intrigued me throughout my life since I was a little boy. And I was very lucky in the beginning when I did books in, in America because I didn't know anything, but I still don't know anything about baseball or apple pie, or I'm trying to desperately find the idea which would show my uh, sort of respect and admiration for America, but it's constantly changing. So I'm trying to tell the story through life of somebody else. Like in the beginning when my child, our children were very little, Galileo Galilei was amazing sort of like a person in the way that he was a scientist, he was an inventor, yet he was put under so much scrutiny. Antoine de Saint-Exupéry fascinated me always because he wrote Little Prince in New York City, I mean, in Manhattan, which very few people know. He never learned English because it, he said, I don't even speak well French. And so he was like me fighting with, 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 with like trying to fit in writing something from his heart and then leaving on the ship to fight the war, even he was 40 years old in, in Europe. So there are these little uh, Charles Darwin, same, not same thing that I could compare myself to Charles Darwin, but that he would uh, go around the world, see things, and then he would think about them and come up with some ingenious conclusion. So uh, I, was, I, I was looking for people. I did a little book about Mozart, it was, it was always intriguing. I did my very first big book was about determination of Christopher Columbus who goes to, for 17 years, he's trying to talk to the different kings and, and princes to give him money because he wants to go west to discover China. 
Now, of course, if I say follow the dream story of Christopher Columbus, it's not politically correct, which in 1991, it wasn't the case. So it's also, it's not about Columbus arriving to America. I mean, it is in the in the end, but it's about him being determined to go on this trip. So very often I have to reconsider some of the ideas I, I had uh, because they would be now looked at in the different light, but mostly I was trying to stay truthful to my idea and the people I admired. So now it's a whole list of different people, which was a little bit interrupted when our kids were little. I was just observing our kids growing up in downtown Manhattan. So our boy was obsessed with fire trucks. So I did a little book about uh, fire trucks called um, and called fire truck, which was about Oh, oh, that was the paper, right? sorry. So this was the fire track book for for lit, very simple book for him who would be, he dressed up in red and was running around the uh, loft uh, making screams. And then I did a book about a little Madeleine who was a girl who walked around the block in Soho and would tell everybody that her tooth wiggles. Uh, so the kids gave me ideas for like 10 years when I was just following what they were doing and I did books about that which now is sometimes hard to, uh, because they say, Dad, you, you took our stories and made books out of them. I said, children, I had to provide for you. So now they all grown up. And, and then sometimes I would be um, looking at the things I was um, impressed with, with um, when, I was a, when I was a child. This is the 12th century poem of um, a Persian poet, Al-Fatar, called The Conference of the Birds, which is purely sort of labor of love about the birds which are looking for their king. And then it was a big book dedicated to my father's trip to Tibet and meeting with His Holiness the Dalai Lama. So these are different influences um, in, in my life and the books I did. So these are some of these, these are amazing variety of stories that you tell from very simple to very complicated and, and not very easy to get across in, in a way that children can can really access this and i and it, it's one thing that really just amazes me about the way you do this the the complicated way that you get things across with the, the amount that you get across in words versus images and that that choice is a very uh difficult and and quite amazing process and i wonder if you can talk a little bit about about the book we came here to really talk about nikki and vera and how you you took that process took tell us a little bit about that story and that process of how you you took this story and brought it into a book that that children can access how you chose the words and and what you chose to express in words and what you chose to express in images so i think my process is uh, my dream would be to write a wonderful big book novel but I can never master English language like that. So I learned from the beginning that I try to express myself in the pictures because then I can go into deepest or, or, or most secret details and it's up to people to sort of translate the, the visual. And because the visual is mostly very rich, I'm trying to come up with simple language which would lead you like on the stage or something to to, to make you discover things. So the story of, of Nikki and Vera was another story which was with me my whole life because I grew up in Prague and I grew up what I thought was a long time after the war, but looking from today's perspective, it was a very short time after the war. It was a few years after the war. And Prague, of course, was full of people who uh, were lucky enough to survive the war, to come back from concentration camps or from um, from... Uh, different different ordeals during the war and there were people who would talk about being uh, in England during the war going on train but it, nothing made really very much sense and it wasn't very much talked about because the system wasn't really encouraging uh, talk about the uh, Jewish suffering the communists so nobody really know how these people got to England how how did they get out of Prague because the whole story was about this man who nobody knew until 1989 when his name came came up because Nicholas Winton was a young man who was 28, 29 when he took vacation in 1938 to go on skiing trip 
And instead he went to see his friend in Prague who said, come to Prague, there are some things happening which we should be, we should help. And the inspiration for this book was for the young people to talk about somebody who sees something strong and he can help and he helps. He doesn't, it was no business for Nicholas Vinton who was an Englishman to be helping some children in faraway country uh, of, of Czechoslovakia, but he comes to Prague in winter, he sees these camps of the little children who were just expelled from the border regions of Czechoslovakia because Nazis or German army took over. And he realizes because he's smart that he, this will not end up like this. And he should try to help to get these children out as fast as he can. And lots of people don't believe him and say, no, it will settle down. There will be no war. Hitler is just trying to scare us. But Vinton knows, so he sets up the office because he can see there are other organizations trying to help, but they are too slow. So he's very good in like paperwork. He makes lists of the children. He goes immediately back to England. He finds foster families which would take the children. That was the biggest problem. Who would sort of adopt the child for time being because nobody knew is it going to be war or not. He had to find money which would be deposited because all children had to get visa which would secure that after the dangers are over, they will go back home. And the parents didn't want to really send their children on this trip because they didn't know and they thought maybe things will not be so bad. So this was known, but nobody knew about Vinton till 1980s when it came out that he was this man. Because once the Germany declared war on Poland and it was Second World War, he closed all the records, put them in the box and knew that his work was done and never went to claim some, some sort of awards or rewards. And he then met his wife, had children and lived his life until his wife found in the crate, in the attic of their house, uh, this, this folder with the names and said, what is this? And he said, you can throw it out. This happened 50 years ago. And he, uh, and she said, no, no, this, 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 these are the lives of the kids. And she went to the researcher on Holocaust, Lady Maxwell, and, and they arranged with the BBC program when, when Nicholas Vinton, who's now in his 80s, 90s, 80, over 80, he, he's invited to this show and under the, he, he thinks it's gonna be talk about some retirement homes. He has no idea what's ahead of him. And the, uh, the, 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 the lady who uh, was very famous, who had this afternoon program, Esther Ranson, she all of a sudden tells his story and, and he, he, we have a sort of BBC footage from that when he, he's embarrassed because he didn't expect it. And then she says, is, is, is anybody here who would have anything to do with these trains? Please, can you stand up? And there are these grown up people, uh, people in middle age sitting around him and all of a sudden they all stand up because by that time they're already in their 50s, 60s. And he's so visibly, he's a reserved man, but he, he has a little tear coming out of his eye. And it's, it, his daughter said, this was, this, this was a surprise for him, which, which all, almost gave him a heart attack. And so in that time, even the children found out how did they come to England because they didn't know who arranged these trains. How did their parents put them on the train? And so I was trying to tell this story in my book, but it was such a good story. It was impossible to tell just the good story. And then I found this book much later, like um, after he, he was revealed, I was thinking, how do I do it? And I even took my son who was 15 then, now he's, so it's um, 20, 12 years ago, to Prague to show him Prague. and. And we came up, up, up upon the celebration of his birthday. And that's how we found out about the story. But they still didn't know how to tell the story, especially in the book form. How, how do you show it in the pictures? And we found a book by one of the children uh, who, who wrote a book uh, about her childhood, how she's a little girl who's playing with her family lovingly. And then she, her mother signs, up, signs her up for this transport to England. And, and she thinks she's going to some fairy tale country with the king. And some people say, how can you send your children so far? And they think, oh, things will calm down um, in, in, in a few months and she will come back home. And as it happens, she's in England, the war breaks out. She doesn't know anything about her parents. She lives through the war in England with other 668 children, which came on this, these trains of Nicholas Linton. And all of a sudden this book by, uh, 
Vera Diamant, uh, Vera Gissing, as she was then under married name, gives me idea to combine these two stories and to show the innocent childhood when she's even living in the town when religion doesn't make any difference because in our memory, Czechoslovakia before the war was a very democratic, very uh, sort of uh, open country when people were so happy about the fact that they live in this little democratic country that they were not like religious fights and stuff like that. So this little girl has no idea and the parents put her on this train um, and, and she saves herself and then she comes back home and there was one picture which was very difficult to do because she comes after the war and of course there's nobody there. So everybody uh, vanished and, 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 and was killed during the war. And, and then came, comes the moment when the time is passing and Nicholas Vinton as an old man is invited on this TV show. So is she, and that's how they sort of meet um, in, in late in life. And, and what was intriguing, what I didn't put in the book, they really were living for 50 years very close to each other. They both had families of two, three children. They, if they would know who they are, they would say, oh, I'm the girl who was on the train. He would say, I'm the man who arranged the trains. So that's the sort of hopeful message um, for the future that there are people who do things they don't have to do and help all of us to, 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 to live in, in some better world. But uh, that's very hard to believe sometimes. He, he lived till age 106. These children would come see him for 20 years all the time and, and, and they call themselves Vinton's children. And, it just is a wonderful story, I think. Uh, and that's why I wanted to pay tribute to him. It, it is a wonderful story and, and you tell it amazingly well and so sensitively. I love the way you, you start out the book by, by saying, Nikki was born in 1909 to a century full of promise. You, you start right out just really honing into your audience of, of children who were also born into a century of promise. And, and you tell Vera's story so sensitively. It's a very difficult story to tell about this child who was just packed off to England. And, and you, you, again, choose those that difference between the words and the images so carefully. Um, and it's, it's just a, a delight. Uh, maybe we can uh, share some of these images. Um, that, that first picture of... Nicholas as a child, right, right, right. The very beginning. I love that. Um, and yeah, for and each book, I should say that for each book, I made many, many sort of versions yeah. of zombies. So this is just uh, the the same image in I, one of the previous versions. But I will not confuse you with it because the the book. This is the final. This is the final book, and right. and and also the. The, the century full of promise, you're right. It's uh, also very difficult. That happens with lots of my books that you find out that there are so many children today who wouldn't uh, even know what um, was Holocaust or what was uh, happening in that time. So I think it doesn't hurt to, to, to sort of uh, be an educator a little bit. And you know, even the the discussion about um, about the the invasion of Czechoslovakia. I, I mean, one of the images I loved is the um, when you describe the invasion, and you you have a, a picture that is so wonderfully evocative of Kristallnacht. You you never use that word, right? But, but there is that picture. Um, let's see if I can find it here. This is the picture when I'm trying to explain the whole political situation with the Munich Agreement and, and uh, invasion of Austria and, and, Kristallnacht. and this is when Nicholas Vinton is arriving uh, just in that time because uh, I think Kristallnacht is November uh, 7 or 8th and after that uh, comes the yes. Munich, Munich Agreement is in September when France and England and it, it, Italy with Mussolini agrees with demands of Hitler and, 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 and stripping the border regions from Czechoslovakia to give it to, 
uh, Sudeten Germans. And just after that comes Kristallnacht with all the looting and killing and pillaging. And that's already the pretext for 1939 when in March, uh, German army invades all of uh, Czechoslovakia. A wonderful picture of the train. This was an interesting picture because for me being from Prague, I always think about England being on the uh, left side. But in this in terms of book flow, it should have been the other way, but I always would see England as being to the left of me, even now I'm on the East Coast of America, so it is really not, but that's, that's how the memory of the child works, I think. So, um... I, I found Nikki and Vera just one of the most amazingly moving stories and just so beautifully and sensitively told. Um, I, I think my, my son is on this webinar and no, no pressure, Chris, but this is a book I would like to uh, read to my grandchild someday. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, so um, it's... Uh, this is, uh, I, I get the feeling with all of your books that, that these are stories that, that you want to tell to children, that, that, it, that maybe you didn't intend to, uh, to get into children's books, but <laughs> I, I feel deeply that, that you really have a message to, to speak to children in these books that you write. And it was deeply rewarding uh, most of the time I spend in children's books because, especially in the beginning, you would go on these um, visits to the bookstores and that the children would come and, and and there's always some quiet, sensitive child, which then you very often find out that somebody completely understood or what you were trying to say. Uh, it, it gets a little difficult once our old children became grown-ups and <laughs> live uh, outside and, and once you are communicating on Zoom instead of uh, seeing somebody in person to be sure that the message or 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 did, did, did people really get it. So that's why I appreciate so much what you have to say because you don't get enough of it these days, really, for sure. And and the story, the story also was that I, I got stuck at one point. I had his story and the story of Vera, but didn't know how to connect it really. There was already a time of the pandemic and my wife basically put it together. So she, like with many projects, was the essential um, <laughs> person behind it. But then I always think, well, people know my name already, so it's no need to put her name on it because in the end it's me. And then I realized I, sh I should have given her uh, credit, which I, I didn't. So uh, she's the one who did, deserves really the... the um, Award for putting all this together, and she's very uh, sort of low key, so she didn't say anything. But I can feel like I should have done it, so I just admitted here. That's all. That's always important to give credit where it's due. <laughs> so, um, and of, of course, I think the other thing that's wonderful about uh, the the best children's books, and I think that we can say this about yours, are, are ones that are enjoyed not only by children but by by parents. Um, and and the the ones that I think we always remember from our childhood are the ones that we read with with our parents, and um, and the ones we read over and over again with our parents. And th these are these are books that that can be done with and Nikki and Vera, especially. So um, thank you for these books that you have brought us. I think they're thank wonderful. So, so um, I don't see any questions now. Um, uh, one question I, I have for you that, that I can think of right now, another one is, um, are, are there artists who, who have um, influenced you in particular that you think have influenced the, the way you, you draw? Is there anyone oh, there are, yeah, of course there are many, and it was uh, sort of happening through uh, a long period of time because when I grew up in the country, which was landlocked, my father was a filmmaker, documentary filmmaker, and traveled. So when I was little, he 
went to Tibet. I did a book about it, but he was also bringing lots of books from outside. And surprisingly enough, I grew up with lots of books by Saul Steinberg. And it was a major, major influence. His, he was so smart and so witty. And he would never consider himself children's books, but he was, he was of course, this, uh, the, the, the fine arts very not accept. I mean, he was somewhere in the in between, but he was the smartest and most wonderful artist, which I go back to all the time. And then when I discovered the the books, I mean, there were books for children, but there were also lots of artists, like in France, like Topor, Andre Francois. There were people in 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 New York, which I'm sure I can't now remember, but they were mostly people who were Tommy Unger, um, Maurice Sendak, and it was in, in amazing. Was was a spiritual master, um, and 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 there are many people with Etienne Delacroix who lives in Connecticut. Um, Etienne Delacroix, I'm sorry, Delacroix. No. Like also nice, but not in children's books. Uh, and there are many, many people I cannot like my friends now, Hendrik Drescher or Elaine Smith. There are lots of wonderful people which I can sort of, uh, older I get, I see more and more things I would like to do, but now I know I can't do it all. <laughs> and I have, I have one question here from the audience. As, as someone who thinks that uh, the book reminds you of the way Chagall used distance to emphasize the narrative in his works um, and wondering if that's someone who influenced you at all. But, 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 of, but of course, I mean, he, he definitely would be a um, major influence. And, and I think it comes across, it was very difficult for me to come up with the idea how to um, make the world of Nicholas different from the world of Vera, who's a little girl. And I started with Vera as like, I was trying to do children's drawings, but the children's drawings are really so smart and so wonderful that it's impossible to fake. So I was trying to uh, invent some world which would be like a naive, but not naive in the way that you, you would say, oh, she was so naive, she was sort of uh, gullible. So I was working on this heart and then I put it on these um, brown backgrounds, which were supposed to, which is interesting now that because the book is right now being printed in my uh, home country, Czech Republic, in France, in Germany, in Korea, and everybody has a different idea about this brown uh, frames around Vera's pictures. So just to finish Vera, that she is a little bit, because her parents are flying and things are sort of like floating. So immediately you would think about, yeah, you would think about Chagall's, exactly the parents, uh, sort of, it's a famous um, uh, Lovers by Chagall. So I'm sure I, I sort of see things and copy them. And what is interesting now with the brown backgrounds that some countries say, it is too sad. We want to make these backgrounds more uh, ochre or yellow because then it's like, and, and I said, but it is like coming from Happy World, which is, um, but it's it, it, it caught in this album from all days. So it's very interesting how everybody has a different take. Same with the book, that I think it's a book full of hope, that it's about Nicholas Vinton who comes up with the idea to save these children. So it's about their future, but some people would see it as the sad book because it's about all the other millions of children who didn't make it, who, who perished. So I think it's like with everything, it depends how you, how you approach it. Another question I have here is, besides books for children, are you creating art and illustration in other ways or other media? Right. So that's a, I, I'm more and more involved with public art, which is very interesting because this is pro bono uh, art, but that goes to a subway station um, in, in um, MTA in Manhattan on 86th Street, um, 456 train uh, on 86th Street when you go to all the museums. There are these eyes of Manhattan. I did a number of tapisseries now, which are in different airports for in, in conjunction with um, Art for Amnesty. And it's a tribute to uh, Nelson Mandela in Cape Town or Seamus Haney in Dublin and big tapestry in Prague celebrating Václav Havel. Um, and, and so these things are a joy because I make like a painting which is not that big, but then it's enlarged in this enormous space and, and, and that gives me idea how it would be if I would be painting large large paintings. Now I have like some series of glass 
So there are different things happening. Some of them just because I've been living long enough that people sort of discover something and then they uh, put it put it in 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 um, practical life. I think it's a hope for young artists because then you can see that you can sort of venture into into other media too. And another question I have for you is, what kind of art do you make for your own pleasure? <laughs> that, that's the problem. That, that's a big problem because I remember when you start as a person who's obsessed with art, you just do your art, that's it. But once you get into some field, if it's animation, if it's books, then you sort of like use your energy to express. I, my books are my art. So through the sketching, through the making them, through finishing them, that's like my sort of fulfillment. So sometimes I do little art if I care for somebody that I make them little something. But um, older I get, I go like, I do it very simple because I have to save all the energy for making a book. So it's a good question, but um, I'm just doing one kind of art now, that's it. Uh, have you met any of the um, other people who were affected by um, Nikki's story? Um, and what was that like if you did? So that's that's wonderful. I, I met, you know, my plan was my 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 dream was that I when I finish the book, I will go to because I knew somebody since 60s in the United Kingdom who is one of the children. When I got her name, I, I never met her. It's Lady Milena Baines Grenfell. And she was a friend of my parents' friends, and I had her name, but I didn't know she's one of the children. She was just the name. Uh, so I'm just a friend. And because this was in 1967 or something when I got her name, but then it turned out she's one of the uh, one of the children. Her sister lives in Boston. She was a principal of the school for the longest time, Ava Paddock. And but I didn't meet anybody because of pandemic. Because I thought I finished the book, I will go to England. I will deliver this book to to hero to Vera Gissing and say, is it okay how I you know, depicted your life, I will meet with Milena, I will meet with Ava. So I met all these people now through the Zoom uh, connection, which is also not like being with somebody. But they are the most wonderful people because somehow through what I'm finding, the, 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 the link between all of them, they survived the war, they somehow were so they all dedicated their lives to help other people in, in their lives. And they are very kind people and very amazing people because almost some of them are very famous film directors and scientists and the head of Israeli Air Force, Hugo Maram was one of the children. But some of them would be maybe not so famous, but everybody was very kind and very dedicated. And then I met very, and a nice man who made a film about this called Nikki's Children or Nikki's Family. I'm sorry if I'm now messing it up. His name is Matej Minaj, and he made a feature film about uh, the, the train and also documentary film. So everybody involved with this whole subject is extremely kind and, and wants to do more and talk to children at schools and explain because the I think the what is the momentum for us today is that when this was all happening, people were saying, oh, this is not going to get worse. We have a borders here, nobody can cross the borders. It will be, the scare will be over in a few months. And nobody, there were some people who had um, sort of um, fear this might happen, but most of the people wouldn't see this sudden change and this incredible, awful uh, disaster coming because that all happened step by step. And now we are all wondering how it could have happened. How come so many people went to the death camps? Uh, it, it, it's stunning. So this is just, just a few months before it all got moving. Even if you look at the events, as you said, Kristallnacht, Munich Agreement, Austria, it was all, if you look at it historically, it was all coming up. And, and, and so that's part of the book because I think you children or people should know about it today. It's just like my other book about the history of life behind um, Iron Curtain. I think these are lessons which sometimes sound like they are not uh, easy reading or looking, but I think it's, it's a good lesson for people to know. I think so too. <clears throat> So um, 
I, I have another comment here that this book would seem to be a great teaching tool. It, do you know whether this is getting into elementary schools? I don't know any of this. this. This is up to the publisher. And in old days, I would know what's happening in publishing house. But now with this book, because I finished in the, the coldest moment of the pandemic, mm -hmm. I would go outside with my art and lean the portfolio with the paintings because I still do paintings by hand. I don't do it electronically. And the editor would come in the car and park the car far away. And he would come to the tree, take the portfolio so we wouldn't get close to each other and took them to the city, somehow managed to get them to Wisconsin where they printed them. So now I'm missing completely the information. Is it getting to schools? Is it getting to people? Is it getting to bookstores? Because one feels completely cut off. So it's yeah. like being with you in Spencer Town, walking, you know, around downtown with, with beautiful tree, leaves falling from the trees, something. I, I, I just can imagine that. I mean, I'm, I'm not there. So I would hope it will get to schools. I actually had, I spoke to some schools and I got a most, it was this is more, most, um, um, it's so touching. This is the third, fourth, fifth grade on the West Coast. And they all made little letters to the children who were on this train. Uh, yeah. And the, the, the whole way how they understand things, how the children were separated from their parents, how they went far away. How, it's just so absolutely um, touching and wonderful, uh, the way how they really would, 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 would understand all this, that it's really humbling for me to see that because only now I found out from one of my school friends who went to art school with me in Prague that her sister who was much older was one of the children when her mother brought her to the train, had her on the list and put her on the train, but then she couldn't, couldn't face it to put her, I think she was nine or something, and she took her out again because she just couldn't send her to faraway country as a child. And, and my friend said, well, the bad part was that later on, the mother and the daughter both went to Terezin concentration camp. Lucky part was that they survived the war. Another lucky part was that another child got the spot on the train. But it's it's that lesson about how it took, um, that these parents brought the children and also in the train station, this is already the Germans are in Prague. So the parents are trying not to cry because they don't want the children to be agitated. The children know something's completely wrong, but parents tell them, you're going on adventure, you're going on adventure, or you will go three days to England and then you will be with some nice family. So nobody wants to cry until the train leaves the station. Then children start crying because they don't want to upset the parents. The parents start crying and in the train station, but they're trying not to cry too much because the German uh, Gestapo police is watching them. So the whole thing is so sort of uh, tragic. And the only good part of it that the children live to tell the story. Mostly nobody else does. Yeah. And, and the wonderful thing is that, you know, the, these books, they're, the, the children do appreciate them. I think, I think too often children's authors underestimate children and, and what they can appreciate. Absolutely. Uh, and I have a wonderful question here. There, there's so much detail on your pages. Um, how much time do you typically spend on a single page in one of your books? So there is no, you know, some page can take a month, some, some page can take a day, but I, I always uh, sort of pride myself in making very detailed art. It became a little too obsessive during the pandemic now because some pictures took months. I'm working on the new project, but I think it's a lack of communication with other people and feeling you are part of like a community which is uh, happening. But I have some books when I look back at it and I know I did it for months and months. Sometimes I'm wondering why. I think it was a little bit of the trying to be accepted by <laughs> new my new uh, country of America, like to show that I'm, because I did pictures for New York Times book review when I could do just uh, one line, but I put hundreds and thousands of little dots in it to show. <laughs> um, and people appreciated it, but it also created this whole uh, terrible ordeal because people wanted more pictures with 
hundreds and thousands of little dots. <laughs> so my whole illustration life was like sitting at the table <laughs> making little dots and or little lines. And it's even in this book, but I think it shows, I can also change the, you know that I'm paying attention. If I if I put lots of work into eight trains which left Prague in 1939, you know they are somehow important because each train was a group of children which went from from Prague to England. So I'm trying to like change the drama or or ten, tension in in the in the book with 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 all this work. It's it's not just so flagellante or something uh, masochistic in it. I think that attention comes across. So um, I think that's all the questions we have. Um, I, I can't thank you enough for spending this time with us. It's been an absolute pleasure chatting with you. And uh, I'm just so glad that, um, that we have your, your work to show for it. Thank you so much. Well, I'm very happy to be with you. And thank you for being so kind and understanding. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And I want to add my two cents worth of thanks to both of you for this wonderful discussion and thanking the audience too for coming with today and um, chiming in and taking time for us. And I want to remind you that there are many other authors on tap for us and um, you can go to spencertownacademy.org and find out the rest of our schedule. And thank you again for coming today. Have a good afternoon. Thank you very much. Bye now. Thank you.